Hello, it's Nico here. Today we're talking about chapter 3 of Kelson's A Pure Theory of Law. We saw in the first chapter, Kelson laid the groundwork for where he goes with his theory. In the second chapter, he got to what is often most talked about when we talk about positivist legal theories. It talks about law and morality, and we saw in quite a fairly short chapter, right? He doesn't spend that much time making his case there. But now in the third chapter, it's a significantly longer chapter than the second one, he talks about law and science. So, I'm assuming that this is for Kelson a more important distinction and a more important topic than that of law and morality. Or at least a question that is more complex perhaps that requires more clarification i think it's interesting that he spends this much time on law and science rather than law and morality right it seems to be a greater concern for him so we know from chapter one that he says that the science of law is concerned with the law manifested through norms applied to human acts he he says okay legal acts acts that are relevant to the law again he starts with a distinction he talks about a static theory of law and a dynamic theory of law one at rest one in motion a static theory of law according to kelson is one that focuses on the behavior that is regulated by norms. We could say the acts. A dynamic theory is one that focuses on the norms themselves that are regulating acts. Like we said in the previous chapter that are making certain human acts more probable than others. So in a static theory, the object of study would be the system of valid norms. In a dynamic theory, the object is the process of how these norms are developed and being applied. So not just this corpus of a system of norms, but how it's changing dynamically. Kelson has an interesting quote early in the chapter where he says that it is a most significant peculiarity of law that it regulates its own creation and application. Today, I would call that, or at least since the 1980s, we could call that the autopoiesis of the law or the self-reference of the law. But, okay, Kelson didn't have that word at his disposal, but he's already recognizing this self-creating nature of the legal system, this kind of closed or semi-closed loop that it's perpetuating itself in and he says what's also worth noting is that law doesn't only have norms that apply externally to itself to society or to human beings but that it also has norms that apply to itself for example how to interpret how to create a new law how to get rid of a law so the law has law for itself. This is what Carlson calls the rules of law. Not to be confused with the rule of law. So he tries to answer how this happens. How does this self-regulating, self-perpetuating system with its own secondary rules of law come into being? And he goes back all the way to Kant for this. He says that using the epistemology of Kant, that the law creates its own object through observing itself as a whole. Meaning that the law or the legal system sees different things happening in society and sees them as related and pulls them together under this category that it calls law. And it it sees a whole or a system there. He 
says this is a purely epistemological move. These connections are not obvious in a certain sense, but they're, they're constructed socially, right? Much like looking at the chaos that surrounds us and calling that nature, for example. You know, just as nature has been invented by society, so the singular coherence of the law has been created by society. And the purpose of legal science, as we know by now, is not in prescribing it, drawing on morals or whatever, utility, I don't know. It only has the purpose of describing the legal system. This is what legal science has to do. Description. And we have descriptions of the law everywhere. He says, you know, the law is, for example, the penal code. And a description of that is your criminal law textbook. So you have first order and second order observation there already. So anyway, returning to natural science, Kelsen puts the natural sciences and the social sciences at odds with each other. And law falls within the category of the social sciences. So he says that natural science works through causality. If A, then B happens. Or if you have B, then you know A was behind it. These are the laws of nature, so to speak. And he says that human behavior and human society can also be linked through causality, right? The social sciences and the natural sciences are perhaps not that different. He says that causality is always there. But the social sciences law has a second quality apart from causation. Namely, imputation. So if you have A and B, you can connect A and B through causation or through imputation, which I think you can already get a sense that it implies a human decision being made, a projection and a decision linking these two things. But a difference between these links, if causation or natural sciences says A, then B, what the law does, it doesn't use then, it uses ought. If A, B ought to happen. So the connection between A and B is different. A norm is not a scientific or natural law that B has to logically follow A. It's a command, an ought to. And sometimes B doesn't happen. And that's where validity comes into play. How valid is that norm really if it doesn't happen every single time? It's not a causal link. It's a description that connects A and B. That make it socially logical for B to follow A. If you commit a crime, A, you don't blink your eyes and suddenly you're in prison, B, right? There's a lot that has to happen in between. It's not a direct causal connection. It may look like it, but it's not. It's imputed. There's a lot of social things that have to happen in between. A lot of communication that has to happen in between A and B. And it ought to happen, but it's not taken for granted. Kelsen goes on an interesting detour in this chapter two, again, talking about primitive man. I don't like the term, but let's take it within the historical context that Kelsen was writing this in. But he says that primitive man probably did not, he's speculating here, of course, but he says that did not explain nature through causality but rather through imputation. What does this mean? It means that when something happened in nature, let's say a natural disaster of some sort, humans at that time didn't have natural 
causal laws to explain why that happened the way we would now, but they would impute a value, a judgment on the disaster happening, right? So if your town was hit by a disaster, the question wasn't what happened, what caused this? The question was who caused this? What did we do wrong to cause this? There's a sense of moral value judgment taking place. You know, the, the idea that nature is punishing you somehow. He connects this with the idea of, of animism or animistic religions, the idea that nature and humans have this relationship kind of like what people have in between them, where if you treat nature badly, it comes to take revenge on you or something like that, or the spirits, they take revenge on you. And he says, if anything was a breakthrough in the scientific revolution or the enlightenment, it was the invention of causality, moving from imputation to causation. And then through this, he makes a kind of a funny observation he says that it's not that we had nature and later society was invented, but that the whole world, including nature, was society first. Relationships governed, linked through norms and imputation. And that with science, the natural world was invented. Nature was discovered through causality. When causality was discovered, nature came to the fore. And Kelsen is aware enough that he says that causation is also not taken that seriously within the philosophy of science, even when he wrote this book already. You know, that science does not work on strict laws, but that probability is what governs natural relationships, if I can call it that. So using this term causation the whole time, is is fine as long as we keep in mind that this is already something linked more to probability than certainty on another detour he also takes some time to criticize american realism the realist school of legal theory and he says that the problem is with american realism is that it tries to somehow predict court decisions. And he criticizes this because he says, you know, it's taking the past and the future A and B and trying to connect it with causality. And he says that, no, it's not causality. It's still an imputation. The court decision is still an ought to. It's not a natural consequence. And I think, although I don't think he says that explicitly, he probably would also, if we remember chapter one, he would also, I suppose, criticize American realists for confusing a pure theory of law with political or sociological theories of law. So while a realist approach can have some power, descriptive or predictive power, um, it's not rooted within the law itself it's rooted in other disciplines so in this distinction between causation and imputation you know Kelsen also says that another important difference between them and which is necessary for the law to work causation never has an end point right we know that you have a then b then c then d the physical world is always dynamic, always having domino effects forever. There's no end point to causation. Whereas with imputation, on the other hand, there has to be a logical end. Or you can't, to take it in the other direction, you can't regress infinitely. When we blame someone, you know, you can always pass the buck to something else with imputation that chain has to stop somewhere the buck has to stop somewhere and someone has to take responsibility 
And this, Carlson says, by the way, is the definition of freedom. It's, yes, being able to do what you want, but the responsibility of being the last instance of imputation. You know, you have the responsibility for that, and you have to take the legal sanction or whatever. Finally, Kelson ends the chapter by defending his pure theory again. He says that he's been accused of being ideological in his theory. And he says that, no, he is the anti-ideologue. He says it is anti-ideological exactly for the reason that he rejects any ideal or correct or right or moral law. And he is the one that can see law for what it is. And his critics are maybe referring to some imminent value, transcendental value, and they are the ideologues, not him. He's the scientist. And he is not trying to prescribe any existing or hypothetical future social order. He's not interested in doing that. He is just doing the careful scientist's work of describing reality as he sees it around him. But yes, that's it for chapter three, Law and Science. I hope that was quite a big chapter. I hope it made it a bit simpler to digest. Thank you and see you next time for chapter five.